sometimes we gather some information. And sometimes that information is what we might call theoretical, but what do you do with theoretical information when it comes to the real world? And I remember years ago I was in a train school and I was learning to run a, a lathe and a mill in the machine shop. And, and part of that was classroom work. We stayed in the classroom, read a book for two weeks. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm not learning anything. I'm just reading a book. But then we went out to the real world and, and began to turn some things and work on those things. And yesterday we talked about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary. And we uh, talked about a need of making a decision to serve Him and draw closer to Him and then to proclaim the gospel. But how do we do that tremendous job? And I want us to look this evening in the book of Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians chapter 2 and our text will begin in verse 12. But there's some wonderful things in Philippians chapter 2. And I just want to go back to verse 5 and begin to read these uh, first six chapters, be, or first six chapters, <laughs> these first six verses uh, uh, before, the six verses before verse 12, and, and because it talks about Jesus, you should have these verses marked or underlined, memorized or something, but notice what it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And we talked about that yesterday, didn't we? That Jesus, Jesus is God. And that's why it wasn't robbery to be thought equal with God because He is God. God is equal to God. Uh, so that's nothing wrong with that because Jesus is God. But look at verse 7. Oh, but He made Himself of no reputation and took upon Him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of, of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. That's right, he died for the cause of Christ, but not just a regular death, even the obedient to the death of the cross, the humiliation and suffering that was there on the cross. And, and oh, we talk about the, we just talking about what's titled the song, Man in the Middle, is that the title of the song? Oh, it's talking about Jesus on the cross. And we come together and we talk about these things, lift up the name of Jesus, and, and we ought to well do that. And notice what it says in verse 9, Wherefore, because of all these things, God, God also has highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. My friends, we have great information. We know a lot about the Lord, and I hope all of you study the Word of God. I hope you uh, do that uh, uh, oftentimes and have a systematic study, by the way, and not just open up the book somewhere and start in the middle. You don't read God. I don't read God with wind whatsoever. Why did I use that as an example? Uh, you don't read a book by starting in the middle, do you? No, no. Uh, read a book at a time. Now, the Bible is made up of 66 books, so uh, you can start. Oftentimes, I encourage people, read the book of John if you've not started reading the Bible. That's a good place. But the book of Genesis, that's the book of beginnings. And if you understand what went on in Genesis, it helps you know what goes on the rest of it. And by all means, if you really want to jump on over to Revelation, the Bible says you'll be blessed if you study that book. And so go right ahead. And if you don't know all about the book, well, ask Brother Evans. He'll tell you he don't know all about the book yet either. Uh, we're still studying those things. And Brother Evans, I picked on him because he knows far more than I do about those things. Uh, but study the Word of God. But when you study the Word of God, what do you do with it? We've got a great commission to feel. And so when the Apostle Paul was speaking to the church at Philippi, he, he told them about Jesus. And this is a great thing that he said about Jesus. But then in verse 12, he says, Wherefore? And I ask you to stand as we honor the reading the word of God. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye, ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Let's go to more. Dear Lord, we come to you now, and I thank you again for our great, great Savior, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what he's done on the cross of Calvary. And now, Lord, I do ask that you help us to lift up the name of Jesus, that uh, we will serve you, that we will draw closer to you, that we will reach out to others while we ourselves continue to grow in your knowledge, in your understanding, to open up your wonderful word and that we might live and proclaim the things that you would have us to do as your children, acting like Christians for our Savior Jesus has bought us from our sin and given us eternal life, and we do thank you for his great work. Now, Lord, we ask you again to lift up his name by your strength and power, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we do have a great, wonderful message, and, and we have a great responsibility. We have a responsibility to the cause of Christ, but in this responsibility of the cause of Christ, we have a Lord who also has a responsibility, and He will not fail us in His responsibilities as we reach towards these goals, and the ultimate goal is to hold forth the Word of God. So first off, I want us to see this uh, first passage of Scripture that uh, we're in in verse 12, our responsibility. In verse 12, it tells us our responsibility is to obey. That's simply it. When you come to know the Lord as your Savior, your first responsibility is simply to, to obey the Lord. When you hear it, uh, obey what the Lord has to say. And, and, and I, I, I use this like uh, following the instructions. I, I was a very, I was not a good student growing up. My mom and dad would have a heart attack if I brought a bee in. Not because I had A's and then I brought in a B, it's because I had all C's and if I brought in a B, they, they, they would die of, of, of excitement. Well, I remember my eighth grade year, we went to Pizza Inn. I went there a lot, can you tell? <laughs> and we went to Pizza Inn in, in Texas, Texarkana, at Arkansas Boulevard. And I remember for my birthday, I, I told mom and dad, I said, I'm going to do my homework this year. They almost fell out the floor. But I did. I, I went to school. And I did all my homework. And I, I, I followed the instructions. And, and at the end of the year, well, that year I brought home all A's and one B. And they, they almost died, my parents did. And at the end of the year, I got a letter from the governor in Texas that I was one of the most improved students in the state. All I did was did my homework. That's all that I did. A little bit later, when I went off into college, English 102, Miss Peterson was my teacher. Uh, she was a wonderful lady, really. And, and, and she said, write a paper like this. Uh, introduction, make it sound good when you start off. State your thesis and your three supporting points. And then the next three paragraphs will be your three supporting points. And then the conclusion, uh, tell us what you proved with your points and how it proves your thesis. And then end it with a flavor. <coughs> All I did was follow instructions, and I made an A. <laughs> and, and many of the folks said, what, what are you doing? I said, I just did what you told me to do. And, and, and so when you follow instructions, you do usually do well. And, and that's what the Lord tells us to do. Just follow the instructions. That's one reason why He gave us the Scriptures, to follow the instructions. But I, I want to point out a little something here. Uh, when, when the Lord says follow instructions through the Apostle Paul, this is one great thing He says about the people of Philippi. He, he says, you're going to be obedient when I'm there, and you're obedient when I'm not there. You see, it shouldn't matter who's around you whether or not you're obedient to the Lord. 
I'll tell you, it's encouraging when there's other people around you being obedient to the Lord at the same time. It, it's encouraging. I, I, I tell you, there's, there, our, when our sister churches do things, it can encourage. Uh, what you do can encourage Mount Calvary in Soxton, Missouri. And it does oftentimes. I, I don't know how many potluck dinners I've had at Brookside Baptist Church because of a Central States meeting. Praise the Lord, y'all out to host them more often. I like those. But you do a good job and it encourages our whole association and the work of Christ. When y'all did the prayer tent, was it not encouraging to be together? But you know, sometimes the Lord calls us to go places and we don't have our brothers and sisters in Christ with us, do we? <clears throat> but I think as you read the Apostle Paul, when he tells these folks at Philippi, he says, you're obedient even when I'm not there. But the Apostle Paul was with him, behind him, even though he was someplace totally different. Oftentimes think of our missionaries and as I was in the foyer, I was looking at your board back there with the missionaries and, 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 uh, and, and what a great, great thing we do when we're supportive of our missionaries and the works that are going on. And I love to see pictures of people being baptized and saved and, and um, the reports of, if you haven't read your reports, read them as you go out. <laughs> And we can encourage them, even though a missionary may be all, all across the world and he may feel physically alone, if you're supporting him, he won't, he won't be really alone. And that's the situation Paul found here with these folks at Philippi. Uh, they were physically separated from him, but he was still with them. And, and, and sometimes we go out into the field and we're at work. Or, uh, I say we're at work. I want you to know that I work... Most of my work is done at Mount Calvary Baptist Church, the physical building where we meet. I go to the office. I'm there all day long. I only have one person in the office, and that's me. And when I get upset with me, I go home. But I know many of you, when you go to work, you're not alone, are you? You're probably there with folks who, who may not even want to believe in God. You, you may be with people who, who are very hateful towards the thoughts of God. And you may even have a dear family member or friend. And, and, and you're praying all the time, Lord, I want to talk to them about, about you, but I, I don't want to push them away or something. Here's what you do. Just, just be obedient to God. Even if it's in those tough times. Last night I didn't mention it in the message with Apostle Paul, but if you read the next verse, I believe that was verse 22 of chapter 22, they begin to try to kill Paul. But he was going to continue to be obedient to the message of the gospel of Christ. And this is how we are to be obedient. In verse, verse 12 it says, with fear, that word fear means with alarm or fright. And first off, I want us to think about it in the father-child relationship. And, you know, it's a sad time that we don't always have that relationship with fathers and sons. But, uh, but you know, sometimes the father would leave a job for his son to do. And the father would go on off to work or whatever business he had. And, and I don't know about you, but when... When my dad came home, if I hadn't done the job I was supposed to do, Mama was going to whoop me. <laughs> my daddy, he didn't have heart for it. But, but I knew that when Daddy said something, we ought to do it. And my dad always had the, his favorite saying was, when I say jump, you ask how high after you jumped. And that's how it's supposed to be. Didn't always work that. But you know, one, one aspect of it, when, the, when your Heavenly Father says to do something, we ought to respect Him and do it. But another aspect, just like Jude talks about, when it comes to those who are lost, we, we, ought, to, we ought to reach out to them with fear and trembling, knowing that we need to share the gospel message that they might be rescued from the fire of eternal damnation. And so it is with trembling. With fear and trembling, we ought to obey the Lord, and this is the result of it. And with fear and trembling, we should move to action. 
If you really care about the cause of Christ, it will move you to action. If you really care about men and women and boys and girls, it will move you to action. And if you think about those people who cared about you, it will move you to action. Now that action can come in various forms. It can come, we've talked a lot about church camp because well, Brother Phillips worked at church camp a lot and there's, there's going to be some uh, folks who need to step up to do those jobs, to do those jobs that are sometimes unseen. And, and uh, I know many of you, if not all of you, many of you knew Brother, Brother David. And he would talk to me sometimes and say, Brother John, we did all this work and nobody's going to see it. <laughs> Nobody pays attention to something not leaking. They pay attention to it if it is leaking. And, 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 but sometimes we need to do those types of jobs. Sometimes it's, it's like your prayer team. Sometimes it's talking to your neighbor. And those, those things we need to do. And we need to be moved to action in obedience with fear and trembling to our Lord God. But as we move to action as a church... I want you to notice what he says in verse 14. In verse 14 he says, uh, do these things without murmurings and disputings. Now murmurings without grumbling. Uh, when, you know when somebody tells you to do something, you grumble about it. <laughs> without those types of grumblings. Without the murmurings. And I usually think about uh, Sister Rosemary Sutton. She was uh, uh, my pastor's wife down in Louisiana and I I grew up with Rosemary. Brother Evans has met Rosemary, I know, with ate fish in, in Texarkana a few times, but she was one of those negative people. We were looking into buying a church van, and she said, well, we'll probably just have a wreck and the kids will die. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that could happen. That could. <laughs> and, and there's a need for those negative people to point out uh, you know, these are things we need to make sure that our bases are covered, that the church van has good tires so they don't blow off, and, and things along that nature. We need the negative with the positive, and, and electricity doesn't work without positive and negative, you know that. So uh, we really need that, but sometimes our negativity comes off as grumbling, and we can, we can be an anchor when the ship needs to set sail. We need to be careful about uh, our murmurings and our disputings. Now, uh, this is, this is I describe it hateful arguing because really uh, argument is, is where you're discussing uh, some topic uh, like logic and things along that may matter. But this is, this is when you get mad at one another for disagreeing. And, and things that we shouldn't disagree about is, is furniture. And colors. And I always like to use the illustration in Mount Calvary Baptist Church. If we're remodeling and somebody decides that we ought to paint the auditorium orange, don't get upset about that. It's just a color. Brother, Brother Rodney Dunlap, pastor of Abundant Life in Christ Baptist Church in Charleston, Missouri. They, uh, they built a building, mission work at the time, built the building and, and uh, it they were deciding to color. And he said, Brother John, they chose for the hallways purple. And that's how I did it to purple. <laughs> he said, I told the people, he said, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. And if you decide to don't, you don't like it, it's just paint. We'll paint it again. That's all right. And by the way, the purple strangely seems to work. <laughs> And, uh, and by the, the men's bathroom is set up like a garage. It's really interesting. It, it, they, they've done some weird stuff and it all works. <laughs> but you know things like that, that's just, that's just what you enjoy, the colors you like, and, and things along that matter. It's, it's not doctrinal issues. It's not whether or not salvation is by grace or by works. It's by grace, it's not by works. That's, that's just what the Bible says. We, we don't have any right to change what God says. But when it comes to serving the Lord, we ought to have this attitude with one another. Well, what does brother or sister so-and-so want? What color do they want? Uh, what kind of vehicle do we need to buy for the church? What kind of musical instrument? What, what do they care about instead of what we care about? One time at Mount Calvary Baptist Church, I did have troubles with that. I was so proud of them. Nobody wanted what they wanted. They wanted what somebody else wanted, so we weren't getting anything. 
I said, well, we need, do need to make a decision. <laughs> and so uh, they picked the oldest person and said, let's do what he wants. <laughs> and that's, that's a good thing. It wasn't anything important, and I don't even remember what it was. But you know, a church that moves without disputings and murmurings, do you know what they're doing? They're moving in unity. In unity. And my friends, if we want to take the message of Jesus, we need to be obedient as individuals and we need to be in unity. It doesn't mean we don't have different personalities. We don't have different styles. You saw my Hawaiian shirt last night. I've decided to wear my other two that I brought. And I've got more at home. I'll just tell you. I like them. And that's, that stuff's okay. But we ought to move in unity as a church to, to forward the gospel message take care of our responsibility and it's just these two. Be obedient and moving out. And then we find this, the Lord will take care of His responsibility. His responsibility is listed in verse 13. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. To do His will. For some reason, God in His infinite wisdom has decided to work through His churches and churches are made up of people. That's why a little bit earlier when I said I work at our physical location, that's just wood and stone. But, but the church is made up of people. And the Lord for some reason has chosen to work through you and through you and through you and through you. Why has he done this? I'll tell you, I, I just knock it up to grace. Not only is God gracious to save us without works, but trusting in Jesus, but he's also gracious to allow us to serve him. Some people think it's a, it's a curse to serve God. Oh, no. If you truly appreciate the blood of Jesus and what he did for you on the cross of Calvary, it's graciousness to serve God. I can't believe that the Lord would call me to pastor church and, and let me stay there for almost 22 years. And, and sometimes I'm amazed at that. And, and I remember when I first went to Mount Calvary Baptist Church, I didn't have any doubts about pastoring Mount Calvary until I was pastoring Mount Calvary. I thought, well, what, what, what is God doing? He obviously has lost his mind. <laughs> but for some reason, God has chosen to use us to do his good will and notice how it's also described here to do his good pleasure did, did you hear that when we serve God it brings him pleasure just to serve him do you, do you know it is not our job to be effective in the cause of Christ did you know that we might talk about the work of the Holy Spirit a little bit later it is our job to simply serve Him. It's His job to bring conviction. It's His job to, uh, to save people. Uh, it's our job to just simply serve Him. And that brings Him pleasure when we serve Him. You think of all the great things that God has at His beck and call. Uh, he's created the heavens and the earth. He's created the rocky mountains. He's created the oceans and the, and, and the Himalayas. He's created uh, the Caribbean. He's created all of these great things. And you know what brings Him pleasure? The fruit of the womb is His reward. We bring Him pleasure when we, when we serve Him. Notice when it comes to serving him, he says, he says he'll take care of, care of all that work. He says to do all things. For God works in you. Anybody coming to know Jesus as their Savior, it's, it's the Lord doing that work. Really, if a church moves in unity, it's the Lord doing that work. Anything that we do, it's the Lord's Lord doing that work. And we need to line up with the Lord and allow Him to help us as we make those commitments to carrying out His work. And I'll give you these two things we need to carry out. The Great Commission and the Great Commandments. The Great Commission is to tell folks about Jesus they need to be saved, baptize them into 
to study the Word of God, to observe all things that Jesus has taught us. And the great commandments, love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. I tell you, when you live in St. Louis, Missouri, I don't live in St. Louis, Missouri, but I've driven through St. Louis, Missouri. It's hard to love your neighbor when you're in that rush hour traffic. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? People cut you off, and you should say, well, I wanted that spot, so I love my neighbor as myself. You have that spot. <laughs> the Lord has goals for us. This obedience and and His working through us, there are goals to this. And, and I want you to see the, the first goal. And that is for us to act like sons of God. Children of God. In verse 15. It's right there in the middle. Uh, that you may be the sons of God. We ought to act like Christians. And, and here's how we ought to act like Christians. Blameless and harmless. Blameless means beyond reproach. Obedience. Harmless means that uh, uh, you're innocent not looking to hurt people, but you really want to want for them to uh, grow closer to Christ as well, uh, beginning in salvation and then, and then discipleship after that. You, you do realize that when you're born again, that's just the beginning of being a child of God. And so we should want that for others. And, uh, Brother Jacob and I were talking about preaching funerals. I, I'm a preacher, and that's what I do. I preach Jesus. I'm not against eulogies, but I'm not a eulogy giver. Uh, I usually try to refer to the person, and if the person has a great testimony, that person's already preached their funeral, and those are those are really easy funerals to preach, I'll just be honest with you. But I, I like to tell people about Jesus. And sometimes when I look out in that audience, and so, Sometimes I can tell that they don't want to hear what I have to say. But I'll grant you and I'll tell you the truth. I'm not there telling it to them because it's something that makes me feel good. I'm telling them that because I want them to know Jesus. Because they're going to die too. And after that, the judgment. The Christian message, the message of the gospel... It's not about winning an argument, but about winning souls. And it's the Lord who does the actual saving and convincing and guiding. We have this goal of our characteristic that we might be, what it says here in verse 15, without blameless, uh, blameless and without rebuke. So the Lord's pleasing. And here's the purpose. Holding forth in verse 16 the Word of God. Holding it forth. Taking it to people saying, look, here's the Word of God. And notice what it says here in that crooked and perverse nation <laughs> group of people. Here, here's, here's the problem. We have a foundation of rule and authority. It's the Word of God. Amen. There's four things the Word of God tells us. It tells us where we came from. God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know it tells us also what our purpose in life is? Purpose in life is found in Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep His commandments. Our purpose is to serve God. It also tells us why we die. Why do we die? Wages of sin is death. It also tells us where we go when we die. I know all of you have watched TV shows and movies and they'll come across these issues. Where did we come from? <laughs> aliens. <laughs> I do find that strange that people will believe that aliens created us, but they won't believe God created us. I just think that's strange. Werner von Braun, well, he was a Nazi scientist, but then he was led in our NASA project. He believed in God. Now we spend billions of dollars to figure out where we came from. The world's looking. 
There's many folks who are depressed because they feel like life is meaningless and pointless. But if you know the Lord is your Savior, you know that every moment of your day is worth an eternal investment. It's not just good for today, it's good for all time. Now, how many times have I watched the old TV show when somebody's died and there's no answer to why it happened or where they went? My friends, there's an answer. Now, the Lord, in every death, He works different things. He's got so many things going on specifically. But in general, the answer is this. We have sinned against God. The wages of sin is death. And after that, the judgment. The Bible says, when you die, you either go to heaven or hell. Very simple. If you've trusted Jesus, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. If you've rejected Jesus, you're going to spend eternity in hell. See John chapter 3, verse 18, what Jesus had to say. So we've got a bunch of information about Jesus. We need to make these commitments. Serve God in obedience. Serve God in unity. Allow the Lord to do the convicting and saving. And we are simply His tools and messengers. As we reach this goal of living a life that is blameless before men and women and boys and girls so that they might hear the gospel. And that when we hear the gospel and are saved, we will grow together as a church to bring glory to Jesus. Here at Brookside, where I am at Mount Calvary, serving the Lord. But it all begins, it all begins with the cross of Calvary. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? As you bow your heads this evening and consider these things, always consider first, do you know for sure that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life and you must be born again? The Bible says that we have sinned against God and come short of His glory and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you have trusted the Lord as your Savior, Will you make a commitment in obedience and serve the Lord in unity with one of His churches to carry forth the Word of God and God will go with you every step of the way. In the Great Commission recorded in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 28, verses 18 through 20, the Lord says, And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord is with us as we serve. Will you give your life to Him? Will you trust Him? Will you obey Him? Will you unite with God's people and serve Him while lifting up the precious.